everyone. I am Jeff Martin. I am the Director of Communications and Public Affairs for the American Anthropological Association. I am a older white male uh, with graying brown hair, uh, more gray than brown than I'd like. Uh, and I'm wearing black uh, framed glasses and I am uh, reporting to you from the, uh, actually the confines of my uh, cozy bedroom. Uh, again, welcome everyone to uh, digging into dissertations. This is the uh, first of a four part series that's uh, gonna be on uh, career development hosted by the Society for Medical Anthropology and the Society for Psychological Anthropology. Um, this four part webinar series is gonna run throughout uh, May. There's going to be one a month, one uh, next month in March, one in April, one in May. We are determining the dates and the actual uh, uh, content abstracts uh, but they uh, will be basically, the next one's gonna be on grant writing. The one in April is gonna be uh, preparing for non-academic jobs. And the last one in May is gonna be on article preparation. Uh, we're working on finalizing those. So uh, do me a favor, you'll see in the chat, I posted a link to our webinars page and we're gonna have them all listed there on the webinars page. I also wanna take a quick moment to uh, plug that we're also having another uh, uh, career webinar series that'll be running each week starting uh, next week, March 4th, uh, called Pathways to Careers. And it's gonna be held each week uh, through April 22nd. So we have a lot of career information out there uh, for you. Another reminder is that all of these webinars are uh, held on Thursdays, usually held on Thursdays. Uh, at 1 p.m. We are going to have one on Friday, uh, but look for it again at that link uh, there. Um, let's see, back to this webinar. To make this more accessible for everyone, we are providing closed captioning and as you can see, ASL interpreting. Uh, I want to direct you to the bottom of your screen. If you take your cursor down to the bottom, you'll see a, uh, an icon uh, that says live transcript. If you click on that, you'll be able to, you'll enable the uh, closed captioning, uh, which should help you. Um, let's see, other than that too, I also wanna uh, remind everyone to keep your, uh, keep your videos off, keep your screens off. It'll help us with the bandwidth and just uh, uh, you know, for us to uh, better reach all of you without any uh, interference. Uh, let's see, I think that's it. The other thing too is if you, again, you'll see the chat room by now, everyone should be familiar with Zoom. Again, you're, if you scroll to the bottom of your screen, you'll see an icon for chat. Uh, we are going to uh, do a lot of, um, provide a lot of information there in the chat room. One of the things I love about anthropologists is that you all seem to uh, uh, jump in on this, which is wonderful. Someone will ask a question and even the presenters don't have to respond. Someone else is responding and saying, hey, I found this software really works. So I found this technique really works. So I love how the, uh, the uh, chat room is used. If you have questions, usually we, we wait until the end for a Q&A and we do have time set aside for Q&A. Uh, however, our presenters uh, were gracious enough in that they said, hey, listen, we'll answer them right on the spot. So if you have a question, start with the word question so it helps us and then, um, and then put your question in there and the presenters will be glad to uh, bring it right up. Uh, so that'll be good. Without any further ado, let me uh, turn it over to Matthew. Um, this is Matthew. Uh, thanks, Jeff and Tanel and Scott and everybody at the AAA for helping us do this. Um, we're all new to the accessible presentation style, so um, work with us as we adjust to this. Um, I guess I'm a middle-aged white guy um, who's bald and clean-shaven with some skinny glasses and a dark sweater over a lined shirt in my home office with a books that you can't read the titles of. Um, <clears throat> our, so um, just to add to what Jeff was saying uh, very briefly, um, annually the Society for Medical Anthropology and the Society for Psychological Anthropology hosts a mentoring event at the AAA each November. Um, we were unable to do that this year, obviously. And so it's taken us a while, but we've tried to migrate over into this virtual space. So um, I'm uh, the mentoring and uh, membership 
uh, seat and the um, SMA. And um, Dick Powis is, or he, he's technically our graduate student seat, but he's no longer a graduate student. Um, and uh, Rebecca Lester is from the S Society for Psychological Anthropology. In the future, we'll also have um, Lauren Cubelis, who's also from the Society for Psychological Anthropology for our conversations. And our goal is really to have conversations. Um, so um, at least this time, I, I think it's up to me to engage both Dick and Rebecca um, on their experience with dissertations and writing them and supervising other people writing them um, and working through revisions and stuff like that. Um, but just to reiterate what Jeff said, um, if you have questions or comments as we go, um, please throw them into the, um, the chat box. Um, Dick, are you ready for some public therapy? <laughs> uh, yeah, so I suppose we should introduce ourselves first, right? Um, my name is Dick Powis. My pronouns are he, him, his. I'm a young man. <laughs> Uh, with medium length hair, glasses, septum piercing, uh, black button down shirt, black cable knit shawl. Uh, I'm calling from St. Louis in my bedroom. I'm surrounded by synthesizers and books. Um, I'm also a postdoctoral fellow at the University of South Florida College of Public Health. And as Matthew said, I'm the uh, chair liaison on the Society for Medical Anthropology board for the Medical Anthropology Student Association. Um, Rebecca? Hi, everyone. This is Rebecca. Um, my pronouns are she, her, hers. And I'm a middle-aged white woman with long reddish curly hair. And I'm wearing a white shirt and a blue, I don't know what this is, sweater, I guess. Um, and I am a professor at Washington University in St. Louis, where I'm, I'm calling from St. Louis. And I'm also the president of the Society for Psychological Anthropology. Um, well, thanks to you both. This is Matthew. Um, so Dick, um, if it's OK, you just finished your dissertation, which I want to congratulate you on publicly. Um, but could you tell us about your experience of writing a dissertation? and um, what you would change now about the process? Yeah. Um, so I, I gotta be honest, I, I, I don't know that there's much I could change about the process. I was sort of fast tracked. Uh, it needed to be done very quickly after I got home from doing my research. And so um, I needed to come up with a quick plan um, outline things, get everything sort of down on paper and just start. Uh, so, and I was not in particularly good shape when I got home from doing my dissertation research. So that was a major struggle. Um, but I think once I sort of started writing, I think that's the biggest challenge when you get back, right? Is to just start writing. And at some point, I, it took me several weeks to put pen to paper after I got back. And at some point I had to just tell myself, write anything, anything, right? And what I found that I started doing, and this is gonna be different for everyone, what I started doing was writing vignettes, writing stories, and not even going to my notes, not going to my journal or anything, not going to my photos. I just started writing off the top of my head about the memories that I had. And I just kept doing that for months, two or three months until I sort of had a better idea of how I could sort these things out and then dig into other things, dig into theory and analysis. I think it was probably four or five months in where I started to kind of burn out again. And I realized that I needed uh, a very rigorous time management system. Um, and again, this is different for everyone, but I, I got, I had a framework. I adopted a framework from uh, Rebecca Schumann um, on Twitter, who is a number of things, a scholar, academic writing coach. Um, and she has this uh, sort of rule of thumb called five, five, five. 
and 555 means, um, which pairs well with your five page uh, uh, blog that I'm sure we'll talk about too. Um, 555 means that for five days, you write 500 words a day, or you edit five pages a day, one or the other. And for her, five, that means maximum 500 words or 500 pages. I was being rushed a little bit. And so for me, 500 was a minimum. And it was really good for my mental health to be able to set that goal. And, uh, and if I wasn't having a good day, I knew I could put 500 words of absolute garbage down and be fine and just walk away and move on to other things or not do other things. Um, a thousand was my soft max. So that was like, if I hit a thousand words, then I felt really good about it. And I could walk away, be kind to myself, which is a big, big part of writing a dissertation. And then 2000 was my hard max. So if I hit 2000, I walked away like uh, whether I liked it or not, because I found that my writing tends to drop off as I go past that. Um, and then the other big uh, sort of strategy I had, uh, like I said, was writing and revising are two completely different things. And so it can get very overwhelming to be writing things and then want to edit them or revise them as you're going and questioning yourself. That's not what this is. You need to just get words down and move on, keep getting words down and move on and then revisit later, right? Revisit with fresh eyes, revisit with feedback from your advisors, right? Um, so yeah, once I sort of figured out that workflow, which I feel like I figured out too late um, or I would have liked to have known this sooner, uh, then everything sort of came together, I think. That was very important. Um, this is Matthew again. Um, thanks, Dick. Uh, Rebecca, can I ask you to reflect on your dissertation writing experience and maybe what you would change about it now, looking backwards, if that's possible? My own dissertation, you mean? Uh -huh. um, yes, this is Rebecca. Um, I wrote up away from my home institution, um, and my relationship at the time took me somewhere else to write up. Um, that was really difficult. If I could do it again, I would not do that. Um, it's a little easier now with the virtual, you know, and Zoom and all that kind of stuff. You can stay in touch a little more, but back then we didn't have that. Um, what would I do differently? I mean, I did something very similar to what Dick talked about where I started with, well, let me back up a second. Okay, one of the temptations, I think, for a lot of students who are writing their dissertations is to feel like you have to read and read and read and read before you're ready to write. And don't do that would be my advice. I really um, want to reiterate what, what Dick said, that you just have to start typing, just start writing, getting things down. And the easiest place to do that is through vignettes, memories that you have, little scenes that you remember. And these are things that will often become your full-fledged eth ethnographic data, right? Because they're, they're certainly were salient enough to stand out to you. So there's something to them probably. Um, so yeah, start, I started with writing vignettes and it took me a while to figure out the structure of the whole thing. And that was very anxiety provoking. And I certainly had, I remember very vividly times where I thought I can't do this. This is too hard. I need to like do something else. Um, Clearly, I worked past that and was able to do it. Um, but expect that those kinds of moments may happen. Um, but yeah, so it took a while to fit, figure out the structure. But I, I think I think I went about it about as well as I could have. I had a really good advisor, so that was helpful. She was very um, a great resource for tips and tricks on how to how to get through the whole process. So um, yeah, Dick. Dick gave some really great advice. Yeah, I, um, this is Matthew again. So I um, probably had an experience like both of you all. And um, one of the things that, uh, as you were both speaking, I was reminded of is um, advice from Karen Ho, who was like, just start with the stories that stand out to you, right? And that, uh, um, you know, my field notes were one thing and the interview transcripts were another thing, but just starting with the things that were kind of indelible 
in my memory was the right place to start, right? Um, and likewise, it took a while to write out a lot of that stuff, but once it started to get written out, there was some growing sense of a structure, right? Um, and um, I have very clear memories of printing all of that stuff out and laying it out on the floor of my apartment and um, basically taking a William Burroughs approach of like cutting things apart and realigning them and then having to go over to the Word document and redo the document um, to reflect how things should be organized. Um, <clears throat> but it was also, and I think this is um, analogous to Dick's experience, like there was some real pressure for me to finish. And um, I think that it took me, you know, six months to write 100 pages and then it took me three months to write the next 250 pages um that it was just uh yeah, at some point it was a sprint um it was no longer a marathon and uh that uh uh that intensity is not something that i um advise for anybody i think that it's really challenging but um, so, I mean, Rebecca, we both had experiences supervising dissertations and being committee members. Are there things that like you've learned in that role that you think is like particularly to serving in the, that role that you would want to pass on to other people? Yeah, so th this is Rebecca. Um, there are a couple of things that, that from what I've seen in my experience that, that can hang people up in this process, of course, if you have external pressures to get it done, then, then somehow it manages to happen. But, but even then, people can feel overwhelmed or stuck, um, might have writer's block. There's all sorts of things. And some of the things that I have found that were helpful to me and seem to be helpful to grad students is to continue to remind yourself that this is a task it is not your magnum opus. It is step one in what's gonna become the next part of your career. And often it can feel like this is the culmination of graduate school, right? And you're gonna get your doctorate. So it should be this amazing thing. And yes, you want it to be great, but it doesn't have to be perfect and it won't be perfect. And so accepting that, that this is, you're gonna revisit this in the future in articles or a book or both so this is not the end of your engagement with this data necessarily. So to keep that in mind, um, another thing that, that I think is helpful to remember is that there are many, many dissertations that you could write with your data. There's not like one magical, perfect answer to how it should all come together. There's lots of different ways that you can do it. Um, so that could be overwhelming or it could be liberating depending on how you, how you view that. Um, we talked about starting with the early stuff or the easy stuff, sorry. Um, writer's block is something that people often run into. It just seems like such a huge task. It is a huge task. And you have, you know, a year or more of data that you're trying to put into some sort of narrative. And in my experience, when I struggle with that, which I do from time to time, what Dick was saying, I think is, that, is a great strategy with the 555. Another way to do it that, that I had to do at one point was to set a timer and write for three minutes. And that was it. And, you know, I might come back later and do three more minutes, but that felt like a manageable chunk to me. So even if I couldn't think of anything intelligent to say, you can write something for three minutes. Um, and that helps to get the flow going. Um, the best dissertation is a done dissertation. So you could do all of your training and get up to that point, but if you don't finish that dissertation, you won't get the PhD. So you just got to get it done and just write, 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 even when you don't feel like it's any good. That's okay. You're going to do many drafts. You might write stuff. This happened to me. You might write stuff that you're thinking, well, that's crap, or it doesn't fit with what I'm trying to say. You can come back to that later. That might be a, an, a chapter in an edited volume that you submit, or it could be an article, or it could be part of the book that comes later. So it's okay if you write stuff that you end up not liking or not using. Don't throw it away. Um, and I would, the last thing I'll say is when you get to the defense part, um, remember that you're the expert in the room. 
you are the one who knows the most about your topic of anybody else in the room, no matter who they are. They may be able to, you know, have some facility with theory or whatever that, that you're still learning, but you're the expert on your topic. And remember that as you're writing as well, that you have something to say, you have experiences that nobody else has, and those are valuable. And um, you want to share that with people. Oh, Dick, please. Hi, this is Dick. I just, I, I want to build on everything that Rebecca is saying. A um, little background, Rebecca was something of a sort of allo mentor for me while I was getting through my dissertation, not on my committee, but kept sort of pushing me along. And all of these things that she has said, I've heard dozens and dozens of times on Twitter from other professors, you know, in my uh, uh, department, um, particularly like, you know, this is not your magnum opus and the best dissertation is a dumb dissertation, perfect is the enemy of good, all of these things. And I just wanna say, I did not fully appreciate any of these until it was done. And so <laughs> I, I just, I really wanna stress like, really think about those <laughs> before you finish, they will help you. Take, take that seriously. Oh, yeah, thanks, Nick. This is Matthew. I, I mean, I think the, the um, faculty probably, we have like party lines that we are obligated to say over and over again, but the reality of them has to be a lived one, right? Um, I always, uh, to add to both what Rebecca and Dick were saying, I mean, I try and impress on students that the dissertation is an archive, um, that in some sense, what it is, is it's just a bunch of raw material. Um, it's, you know, one step away from being raw material and that you've written it up, but it's there to be mined later um, for articles, the book that it's going to turn into, if it turns into a book, you know, chapters, conference talks, whatever else it is, it's a living archive for you to mine, right? And um, I mean, my experience was collecting so much stuff over time that um, only some of it could end up in the dissertation given the time constraints that I had in only some of it could end up in the book. And so over, I think I just pin it, fit, like published the last thing I'll ever write about sleep until I'm a really old crotchety person. And it was still new material that had never been written up because it was just in this archive in some respects. And I recognize that that's a particular experience and other people have other experiences, but these are projects that you will live with for a long time in one form or another. The other thing I really try and impress on people is to like come up with like a plan A, a plan B, and a plan C for the dissertation. And the plan A is like the ideal version of it with all of the chapters that you want to write and all of the time in the world to write them in, right? And that plan B is going to be a couple chapters less than that, right? And plan C is going to be a couple chapters less than that, right? So like if you have to get done, what is that plan C option? And, you know, to have the conversation with your committee about it, right? That like, this is what you want it to look like, but, you know, the reality is that there's only so much funding in the world. And so it, it might end up looking like plan B or like plan C if you get a job offer somewhere, right? And in my experience, most committees are really flexible about those expectations, right? That like, one of the challenges that a lot of dissertating students have is they imagine their committee to have one set of thoughts when in fact their committee is much more flexible than that. Um, and so I always try, I always tell students to communicate with committee members in some regular way, right? Like set up an alarm, send people an email every month just to let them know that you're there um, and that you're working on stuff. You can tell them that you don't need a response from that email, but having that communication channel open is really critical, uh, especially if anything comes up, but also to make sure that you have a sense of what the reality of your committee is rather than this kind of ideational version of them. Because they're there to help you ultimately, right? And like Rebecca said, they recognize that you're the expert. I mean, I think that's especially true in anthropology where we all have very particular data 
that we're that we've collected and that we're working with, right? Everybody is going to recognize you as the expert by the time you are turning in drafts of your dissertation. Okay. Um, we have time for questions if people would like to put them into the chat. Um, and while people are doing that, um, if Dick or Rebecca have last thoughts, yeah, Dick. Yeah, I just want to throw in one more technical tip. Uh, I benefited uh, uh, a lot from Scrivener. Um, so if you get a chance to use Scrivener, I see Rebecca nodding vigorously, yes. Uh, I think Rebecca got me into Scrivener actually. It's uh, it's 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 sort of a word processor style writing app uh, program, but I think it was originally designed for like screenwriters. And so um, uh, your document is sort of organized into uh, like index cards and parts and pieces, and you can move them around. Um, this was crucial for my writing phase, it was not so helpful in my revision phase. Um, so word of warning there, but I swear by it, it's worth every penny. I don't remember how much it costs, 30 bucks or something. Um, but yeah, do check that out. Uh, this is Matthew. Oh, uh, Rebecca, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Um, this is Rebecca. Uh, we had a question in the chat about when it comes to structure and flow of the dissertation, how do you overcome making the flow as easy as possible to understand for anyone reading it? So here's something that I did with my last big writing project. And I don't know that anybody's that, that people would find this helpful with the dissertation, but I just will share it briefly and you can kind of decide from there. So it helped me actually, because I was so close to my data, and of course it all fit together in my head. I knew all the pieces that fit together. And then, but trying to get that all on paper can be challenging. Like how much detail do people need? You know, you don't want to give too much, but you want to give enough that they're going to be able to follow your argument. And what I found helpful was, was kind of displacing my topic. And by that, I mean, I was writing about a particular medical condition um, that I happen to know a lot about. And so, teasing that part was challenging for me. So I made up an idea of some other condition that I know nothing about because it's fake. And then I started to ask, what would I need to know in order to understand what this condition is and what these arguments mean? So something like that can be helpful too, to just kind of take yourself out of what is so very familiar. And that can help you kind of think about what level of detail is going to be needed for somebody who doesn't know anything about your topic to be able to engage with your argument. Um, yeah, I would add to that that um, the, the um, flow is less important than um, it being done in some respects. That like my experience reading dissertations is often that like one chapter doesn't neatly segue into the next chapter and that that's totally okay. Um, the flow is something that can come later through the revision process, but like the, the reality is, is that the, wh whatever you do with your dissertation content is going to be totally different than what the dissertation was. So working on the finesse around all of that stuff is um, not necessarily labor that gets uh, repaid very, very well. Uh, but I think to all, uh, boost what Rebecca was saying. Uh, one of the challenges that I've often found in my own writing and other people's writing is the balance between how much you need to tell your audience and how much you know. Um, and that uh, one of the challenges with dissertations is that people feel like they have to demonstrate everything they know about something. And that's not necessarily a good thing for your committee, right? Like a, if you get to the point where you're turning in 70 page papers, or chapters that are just filled with detail, you've done too much. Um, and you need to find a way to let it breathe a little bit more. Um, <clears throat> uh, we have some other questions. So um, 
Magdalena asks, um, what kind of advice would we give to non-native English speakers? Um, she's a native Spanish speaker and currently having difficulties writing in English. Um, would you recommend to start in Spanish and see where that takes her or should she aim to do it all in English? Rebecca's processing. Yeah, I would say I see the benefits of both approaches. My, and you could go one of, obviously one of two ways. Um, I think it depends on how, whether the language issue is blocking your thinking. And if you're really trying to puzzle out pieces of your argument, then I would do that in my first language and then translate it. If you're writing descriptions, if it's not blocking your thinking to write in English, then, you know, that saves you labor later and, you know, you get used to practicing how you're going to present your material in, in English. But I would say if it's if it's getting in the way of you writing, then then by all means start in your first language and you can always translate it later. That would be my take. Yeah, this is Matthew. I, um, I've had students whose first language language were um, Spanish and Chinese, and um, they similarly had experiences where writing in English was challenging, especially because their fieldwork was in Spanish and in Chinese. So like having to move between their field language and analytic language was tough. Um, in both cases, they ended up paying um, copy editors to uh, proofread the final version of the dissertation. Um, I don't know if it was entirely necessary, but it was something that they felt like was was helpful. Um, but I, you know, I think that in in many respects, writing to get it out is the most important thing, and whatever language that is is probably the best language to do it in. Um, we have some other questions. Uh, Erica asks, um, it sounds like it might not be an issue for you personally as writers, but do you have any advice for those of us who don't encounter writing block, but instead the opposite? My problem is more often that I overwrite and can't keep within myself, whoops, and <laughs> uh, self-enforced page limits. It's not the worst problem to have, but I guess it's taking too much time. I tend to, I'll, I'll buy Rebecca some time maybe, um, and Dick too, if he wants to add into this. I mean, I tend to tell people that like, if a section is longer than seven to 10 pages, and I know that's like a span, like it, it, then it's too long, right? And so you, for your readers, you wanna make sure that you can, you know, parcel that stuff out into like seven to 10 page sections, right? So, um, <clears throat> and I think it's often the case that if you've been writing about something for more than 10 pages and there's no subheading in there, there should be a subheading in there. You just haven't seen where it goes yet. Um, so it might not actually be a problem without looking at your writing, Erica. I, like it might not actually be a problem of writing too much. It might be a problem of not identifying the like um, the breaks within that writing that you're doing um, because there's stuff there it just might need to be shaped in particular ways yeah I would I would add to that that used to be my problem <laughs> but then it stopped being my problem um, but I, I agree with everything that this is Rebecca by the way I agree with everything Matthew said and I don't know if this is a place where you know uh, where you're maybe giving, I don't know, having not read your stuff, but if you're getting into too much fine grained detail, um, I would practice pulling out your, your view and start by going back through whatever you've written and take the first sentence of each paragraph and make sure you're not repeating ideas, make sure that those first sentences are flowing in a logical way um, and that you're aiming for approximately 30 pages a chapter, 30 to 35 pages a chapter. So if you're getting much longer than that, then then maybe you need to break it into two chapters or or rearrange something else. Um, so we have two questions, and I wonder if we can smush them together for the sake of time. So um, the uh, one is from Annika, and she asks. Um, <clears throat> 
my question is whether you have any advice regarding overcoming the feeling you don't have enough data. This is speaking from personal experience, but I think this is especially present for grads who are doing did field work during COVID where data collection process was difficult. And the other one, which I think we can join together, um, is about the, from Clay, it's about the from generic conventions of ethnography um, and the importance of including a case study um, uh, is in relationship to an ethnography that's multi-sided and um, is more focused on kind of larger abstract sites. Um, I, I mean, I, uh, I can take a first pass. I mean, I think that the generic conventions of ethnography are really something to contend with. Um, and I, if there is a challenge with committees, it is um, making sure that you have enough ethnographic content in the dissertation to make them feel like it is an anth anthropology dissertation. Um, and that sometimes, uh, the, the especially with kind of like multi-sided stuff um, or institutional stuff that that ethnographic stuff can kind of drop out in some respects. Um, and so making sure that you've got enough of it is really important. I think along and this goes to Annika's part of the uh, Annika's question. I think if you feel like you don't have a lot of it, the important thing is the role that it plays in the document, right? So um, rather than burying it after some 20 page description of a process or a place or something like that, lead with the anecdotal um, evidence, right? Or I don't, I don't really mean anecdotal, but lead with the ethnographic evidence and then leverage that into the other content. Um, I mean, when you actually look at many book length ethnographies that anthropologists publish, there's not a lot of data in a lot of them. Not to sound like a sociologist, but like the, that we do a lot with very little in many respects, right? And that the, the important thing is working on the framing in order to make whatever you're focusing on really illustrative and te like um, textually meaty for your audience. Um, I'll, I'll let Rebecca add to that if she'd like to, or Jack. Yes, this is Rebecca. I, I love the way you put that, Matthew. Um, and I think you're absolutely right that that it's a, it's about the role that the data is playing in your dissertation. And, and if you, like he said, if you foreground it and then you're unpacking it, you're analyzing it and you're, you're you know, bringing all the other stuff to bear, then you can really do a lot with, with what may seem like not very much. Also, I will say, Grad students always have more data than they think they do. Mm -hmm. So keep that in mind too. It's true. Um, so I think technically we're out of time. Um, that was a fast, breezy conversation. And I want to thank you all for being here with us. Um, there, um, as Jeff mentioned earlier, there's going to be other opportunities um, over the next few months, and we'll try and give you more lead time in registering for them. And um, we hope that we'll have some guests for some of that. Um, but we want to make sure that this is here as a resource for you all as we move forward. Um, and, uh, and just want to thank you again for participating. Yeah, thank you, everyone. It was great to see so many people here. And I wish you all really good luck with your writing. Yes. Hi. And again, this is Jeff Martin at uh, AAA. I want to remind everyone that you can look, uh, you can view the upcoming webinars from SMA and SPA, as well as uh, AAA webinars on career um, advancement at AmericanAnthro.org slash webinars.